It's good to be here. Dr. Chapman asked me if I'd speak today on systematic reviews, and uh, um, I elected to do so looking at discordant systematic reviews, and uh, sometimes we'll get those, and he as a, uh, an editor to a journal will uh, see those come across his desk quite, a, quite often, so that's what we're going to talk about today. And so I think most of you know by now that this is an evidence pyramid and that systematic reviews are at the top of the evidence pyramid. And that is that systematic reviews are believed to provide the strongest quality of evidence. And I think you also know that if you've been looking at the literature over a period of time that the number of systematic reviews are uh, increasing over time and uh, this is spine literature, systematic reviews published in PubMed in the last 20 plus years, and you can just see that the numbers are increasing. And so when you have increasing systematic reviews, uh, the likelihood of coming up with discordant results increases. And so what happens when you have discordant reviews, which do you believe? And so let's take a look at an, a couple of examples today, see if we can illustrate a few points. So the first one is this study that uh, of systematic reviews that were done a few years ago, reporting results of unilateral versus bilateral percutaneous kyphoplasty <coughs> in patients with uh, vertebral fracture. And so you can see that uh, this particular uh, systematic review by Chang published in 2016 uh, reports on pain after surgery and uh, basically reports that there's no difference in uh, pain. Is there a pointer on this by chance? Uh, no, but what you can do is press on the button, Jeff, and it'll, it'll highlight what you want. Oh, I see. Yeah. Like this. Okay. Oh, yeah, it sure is, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so this is the main difference here, no, no difference in pain. And then uh, a few months earlier, <laughs> I did that, didn't I? No? Okay. There. <laughs> a few months earlier, a systematic review by a different individual was published on the same topic looking at the same outcome of pain. And uh, you can see here that they in fact found a difference in pain that favored the unilateral. So which do you believe? Let's take a look at another outcome on these two papers. One is restoration rate. Uh, the Chang 2016 study uh, reported a uh, significant difference in restoration favor in the unilateral. You can see that right there. But the uh, 2015 study showed no difference in restoration. Again, which do you believe? Well, let's just back up a half step and just talk about systematic reviews. What are systematic reviews? And basically, you can read the shortened definition that I put up there, but it's a, it's a review that uses rigorous, systematic, and transparent methods uh, in order to minimize bias. But a lot of people, in my experience, misunderstand systematic reviews, and they believe that systematic searches of the literature equals a systematic review, and it doesn't. A systematic search of the literature is just a small subcomponent of what a systematic review entails. It's a much bigger thing. Not only does it entail systematic searches, but also it includes a clear statement of objectives and a priori eligibility criteria. You have to decide ahead of time what studies you're going to include, what the populations are, what the interventions are, the comparator and the outcomes prior to starting the review.
you have to have a reproduce methodology. That is, somebody should be able to take your review and repeat it exactly the way you did it if you have the correct methodology. Am I not aiming this directly? There. Risk of bias, you have to have a risk of bias assessment. You have to understand the quality of the individual articles you're looking at and you have to assess how good of those, the quality of evidence is for those particular articles. Do you have to aim it at some receptor or somewhere? Up there, okay. Uh, then you have to have synthesis of findings. You have to take your findings, you have to put them together uh, in a way that's understandable. And you can do that quantitatively with a meta-analysis, or if you don't have the right criteria to meet a meta-analysis, then you can put it together qualitatively, but it has to be synthesized. And then lastly, it has to be presented in a way that's understandable and presents a, a, a picture to the audience. So systematic reviews really are observational research studies. Okay, it's not just sitting down one day in front of your computer and searching the literature. It's actually a research study. And as such, each of those are subject to varying levels of quality. Whoops. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, this, these discordant systematic reviews again to see if we can try to ferret out why the differences. So I wanna look at just uh, one of the criteria for systematic review, and that is what studies are included and what studies are not included. And so you can see that there's only two studies in these systematic reviews that are shared by them. The other studies are not. And so why is that? For example, did the 2016 study how come they didn't include the ones that are listed on the bottom? You should be able to go to their paper and find out if they identified those. And if they did identify them, why did they exclude them? They should give a reason why. In both of these studies, or I should say in neither of these studies, did they do that. So I can't tell why those studies were not included. Did they just miss them? Did they not like their results? Did they not meet their criteria? We don't know. So, one of the criteria then that we're gonna circle back to is this idea of identifying what studies are excluded and making sure you report why you excluded those studies. Let's take a look at another potential criteria for evaluating the quality of a systematic review, and that's a publication bias. And so I thought I'd just circle back a little bit and talk about what is publication bias. We hear it talked about, but I thought we'd talk, just discuss it for a second. What is it? Well, it's also called smaller study bias. And generally speaking, small studies with negative results tend to not get published as often as other studies, either bigger studies or studies with positive results. And so the results of a systematic review that, do, that doesn't have access to these unpublished studies is gonna be biased in favor of uh, a positive finding in general. And so it, it's helpful to try to understand if this phenomenon occurred. And we, it's difficult to know if a study's unpublished, right? 
it's difficult to know. Uh, for example, if you're involved in a in a uh, research program and you're looking um, at several individual uh, potential studies so that you can publish a bunch before you uh, make professorship, for example, you might be looking at a dozen different studies on your desk that you're trying to get off the ground. And you're evaluating some of the literature and you find that you have this interesting question and you you go and pull some records and you're gonna put together a little research study and you get busy and it turns out that it's a small study and it doesn't look like there's gonna be anything there for, in terms of positive results. You're likely to put that in the dresser, or not in the dresser drawer, but the desk drawer. Right, and move on to something else because you know you have time commitments and et cetera. And so it's difficult to know. Nobody's gonna know that that happened. And so it's, it's hard. One of the techniques that we use is a technique that's a statistical technique and it's called the funnel plot. And you've probably already heard about that. But let me just go over the anatomy quickly of a funnel plot. Um, on the x-axis you have the particular uh, outcome measure effect size. And so uh, down here you have an odds ratio. And this line here represents the overall effect of the meta-analysis, right? And so in this case, the, uh, the actual logarithm of the odds ratio is point, about 0.3 is the, uh, is the number. And so they draw the line at 0.3. And then on either side of the line, you would expect the number of studies to be roughly similar statistically. And then you would also look at the uh, y-axis and, yeah, let's see here. It's, Sorry about that, but you look at the y-axis and you have basically the uh, standard error on the y-axis. Bigger studies will have smaller standard errors. It's actually the inverse of the standard error. And s smaller studies will have larger. And so you would expect to have smaller studies uh, more dispersed down at the bottom, and you would expect to have uh, larger studies tighter to the line at the top, and that's where you get the funnel idea. And so these are examples. The top one, you can see there's relative symmetry, and at the bottom, it's asymmetrical, and that would suggest that there are uh, some studies that are left out. And so what about, what about our example? So FANG, the 2015 study, reported their funnel plot. Chang didn't have a funnel plot, so we don't know if they looked at publication bias. But FANG did and, and reported it and suggest, this funnel plot suggests that in fact there were some studies left out and that unpublished studies could have had an effect on this person's results. Let's look at another example of discordant systematic reviews. So, uh, this was a project that we were involved in a few years ago. Um, uh, Dr. Hurlbert et al. published a study on uh, a pharmacological therapy for acute spinal cord injury. And uh, they f this group formulated a clinical guideline around a systematic review that this individual and his colleagues conducted. And uh, the clinical guideline recommendations were that the administration of MPSS for the treatment of acute spinal cord injury is not recommended. Clinicians considering MP therapy should bear in mind that the drug is not FDA approved for this application. There's no class one or two medical evidence supporting the clinical benefit of MP in the treatment of acute spinal cord injury. Scattered reports of class three evidence claim inconsistent effects likely related to random chance or selection bias. 
And, and then he talks about how uh, MPSS is related to death. And so this was a clinical guideline that came out uh, in 2013. And it was based on a systematic review that this individual had done. And uh, as many of you may know, MPSS is, had been the only pharmacological agent that has shown any uh, benefit, al although small clinical benefit, in acute spinal cord injury um, patients. And it was based on three studies that were done by the uh, NIH um, and uh, those have been criticized uh, numerous times. And so another systematic review done uh, a few months later by this individual, Bracken. Bracken is actually the principal investigator of the NIH studies. But there have been other studies published since then. And so his conclusion was high-dose MPSS therapy is the only pharmacological therapy shown to have efficacy in phase three randomized trials when administered within eight hours of injury. And so the recommendation is that you actually should use it. So how do you reconcile these discordant systematic reviews? Well, um, one way to do that is to uh, evaluate them with respect to a quality of evidence checklist, and that's called AMSTAR. The AMSTAR 2 is a 16 item checklist, but they have seven critical items. These are the seven critical items. Number one, did the individual write a protocol for this systematic review and get it registered? Number two, did they do a complete search? Number three, did they list the excluded studies and say why they excluded them? So you can tell whether they've actually identified all the current literature. Did they do a risk of bias evaluation? Did they synthesize the data? Did they consider the risk of bias in the results? And then finally, did they factor in whether or not there was publication bias? Those were seven, those are seven critical domains in this checklist, and then they've got nine non-critical domains. And so if you look at the two systematic reviews, the one by Herbert and the one by Brock Bracken, you'll see that um, one of them was just performed poorly. The only thing that they accomplished in their systematic review was a systematic literature search, where the other one was more complete. So now, AMSTAR has a system in place where you can actually come up with a confidence level of the results, high, moderate, low, or critically low confidence in the results of the systematic review. And they basically say if you have, if you have no or one, a single non-critical flaw, um, you can still have high confidence in the results. And then if you have more than one non-critical, you can have moderate confidence. But if you have a critical flaw, if you have one critical flaw, then you, have, you can have low confidence. If you have more than one, then you should have a very low, critically low confidence. And so if you look at this, there's no comparison between the two systematic reviews. And unless you have a pre-assigned bias yourself towards something, an objective person, I think, would would uh, side with the Bracken review. In this particular case, so this, is, this was an interesting situation because I was asked to evaluate the literature as a non-surgeon and uh, somebody who is not invested in the treatment of spinal cord injury. 
And as I reviewed the literature and as I listened to uh, lectures from both individuals concerning these systematic reviews, you ask the question, well, how can this happen? How can you come up with, with two completely opposing opinions and about the literature? And, and in this particular case, I think it was a case of the of the one surgeon being biased against it, and and that's how, what filtered the the data. So systematic reviews, I think that they're an important contribution to the literature. They, if it's done correctly, and they're they need to be rigorous, systematic, and transparent in the methods. You have to remember that systematic reviews are not done uh, one evening when you've got a couple of hours and you're gonna have access to PubMed and can review the literature. They're observational research trials. And as such, they need to uh, have a well thought out protocol about how you're gonna go about including studies and which ones you're going to exclude. And, uh, and then discordant reviews that ask the same clinical question uh, can be compared using the AMSTAR 2 tool, which you can get off the internet pretty easily if you want to qu compare the quality of the particular studies. So I think that's all I have, and I'm open to any questions you might have about systematic reviews, discordant or otherwise. Anybody have any? Alex, you got a question? No. No question? Okay, thank you.